I'm not sure what your sense is and how you feel, but I am more and more coming of the opinion that Facebook and Instagram, particularly amongst the other social medias, uh, exist to tell us simply that we are missing out. Do you feel that ever? I'm convinced that the only reason they are there is to tell me all the stuff I'm missing out. I, I look at my various friends and colleagues, all 16,000 of them, and, uh, and I'm discovering who's got what. And when I discover that I don't have what they've got, I say to myself, you're missing out, Luke. Shame. I, I, I look at what they've been doing, and I say to myself, well, Luke, you didn't do that. You're missing out. A and it seems to me that social media today just feeds our FOMO. Do you know what FOMO is? I was quite impressed. I, I'd written this at my introduction earlier in the week, and one of them, the guys used this at Bible study, and I thought, oh, I was hoping to be able to tell you what FOMO was, but he beat me to it. FOMO is the fear of missing out. And I'm, I'm, I'm convinced we live in a society who is shaped by FOMO, the fear of missing out. But here's my question to us this morning as a church. I wonder if FOMO has quietly crept into our Christian life. I wonder if it started to influence our Christian lives as well. Have we started to face a sort of FOMO in the church? See, here's the thing. We, we make decisions as Christians to live for Jesus. When we do that today, are we missing out? Uh, when you and I make sacrifices for the gospel, are we missing out? Uh, when you and I make decisions to serve, rather than socialize, are we missing out? See, sometimes it feels to me that the unrighteous are having all the fun, but the righteous, the Christians, well, we're just dull and boring. And so sooner or later we ask ourselves, ourselves are we missing out? Of course, behind that is really a much deeper, far more significant question, and that is, is this all worth it? He is getting up early on a Sunday morning. He is getting up early every morning to read your Bible, to gather with God's people, to fellowship. It is going out in the middle of the week. It is making all the sacrifices you're making for the kingdom. Is it worth it? Is living for Jesus worth it for you? Is remaining true to his name worth it for you? Is enduring hardship and suffering in this world, is it worth it? Is it worth it? I guess that's a question that young people in particular will have to wrestle with. Uh, given the, the amount of temptations they face, uh, given the attraction of the world, young people in particular will have to wrestle with, is it going to be worth it for you? Is it going to be worth it for you to follow Jesus and to keep following Jesus through thick and thin to keep following Jesus through every stage of your life. Because it might be, there are some people who are a little bit further down the road than you here this morning, and it might be that they too are wrestling with that question. I wonder if you've got here this morning and you're feeling the weight of your faith on your shoulders. Maybe you're going through a difficult time with friends or with family, uh, and, and for you at the moment, being a Christian is hard work. It's hard. You feel that rejection. You feel the weight of that. Uh, you're feeling tired, possibly even feeling confused with all these messages out in the world. And so as you wrestle with your own faith today, you say to yourself, is it worth it? Should I keep going? Should I keep going? Well, as you come back with me to Revelation chapter 3, I wonder if the church at Philadelphia asked that same question. See, here's what we know about them. We know that as a small church, they were rejected and excluded by the Jews in the community. We know that they were shut out. And if the pattern of the other churches is to go by, then to be shut out is not just to miss out socially, it is to miss out economically. We know that they faced hardship and difficulty. We know, because of the way Jesus describes them, that they seem to be a small church, a frail church, a church of whom Jesus himself says, you've got very little strength. In other words, this isn't a mover and a shaker of a congregation. This is a church that's just battling to survive. And they're feeling the weight of the world's oppression on their shoulders. I wonder if they asked, is it worth it? 
Of course, I don't know. I don't know if they were thinking that. I don't know if they asked that. But here's what I do know. And I know this categorically. I might not know what they asked, but I certainly know what they did. And what they did, did you see it there? Have a look at verse 8. What they did despite everything, what they did was press on in faithfulness to Jesus. So Jesus says, verse 8, you have kept my word. You have not denied my name. Here is a church who through thick and thin has remained faithful to Jesus. Can I just point out to you, this is the only of the letters that does not have a rebuke. There's no rebuke in this letter. This is a church who is commended because they've kept on going on. They've remained faithful. You remain true to my name, Jesus says. You kept my word, Jesus says. And because of that, because of that, here's the thing. They will not miss out. They will not miss out. How do I know that? I know that because of what Jesus goes on to tell them. See, despite their hardships, despite their difficulties, they are not going to lose because they follow Jesus. In fact, when you follow Jesus, you don't miss out because his promises far outweigh anything that we go through in this world. I want to look at two of those things this morning as we look at the rest of this passage. I want you to notice, firstly, please, the promise of vindication. I want you to notice the promise of vindication. Here's what Jesus says to this group. He says, I know you're struggling. I know you're facing hardship. I know that group over there are persecuting you, and this group over here are hurting you. But I want to tell you, Jesus says, the day is coming when you will be vindicated, when you will stand glorious at the end of it. Of course, in the midst of your weakness and frailty, you're saying to yourself, well, how can he say that? How can he possibly know that at the end we will be vindicated? How how can he know that we will get through this and we'll be glorious at the end? Because he knows who's speaking. Did you see that? Rolt alluded to it earlier on. This is the one who is holy and true. This is the one who holds the key of David. Uh, Remember, Revelation is a picture book. It's, It's using words to paint a picture. And when we look at the picture, we'll understand what's going on. I think we're meant to conclude from the key of David, uh, not that Jesus has a big bunch of keys around his waist. No, he is the king. See, that's the one who holds the key of David. The key of David is the one who sits on the eternal throne that was promised to David's descendants. The one who holds the key of David is the one who is the final and forever king. Uh, To quote Rolf from earlier on, it's the one who has the crown for all eternity. It's the one whose authority never fades, never gets removed. It's the one who has all authority, not just on earth below, but in heaven above. It's the one who, when he opens a door, the door stays open. And when he shuts the door, the door stays shut. And all authority and truth belong to him. It's worth realizing that because it determines who you will listen to. See, when the world is calling out for you to follow them so you don't miss out, you have to make a decision whether you're going to listen to the world who has no authority, and who is not eternal, or whether you will live to listen to the king who is holy and true, will you listen to Jesus? Because what he says is critical. What he says is life-changing. And what he says, keep reading, what he says is he is going to deal with every one of their enemies. With every one of them. See, the local synagogue might actually exclude this group from belonging Uh, They might be trying to imply to this group of Gentile believers that you're unloved by God. You're rejected by God. You're on the outside. (laughs) But this synagogue, here's what they will discover. Here's what they will experience from the truth of the king's very own hands. Look at verse 9. He says, I will make them fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. (laughs) See, he writes to this group of Christians who who are probably feeling pretty unloved right now. And he says to them, don't forget, the day is coming when not only will your enemies be defeated, but they will fall down at your feet. Because here's what they will recognize. They will recognize that the king of kings, the one with all authority in heaven and on earth, loves them. Loves them. This group. This frail, weak, feeble group of Christians. The king 
loves them. The Jews will discover their biological heritage means nothing, nothing actually, when it comes to belonging to God's people. No relationship with Jesus is everything. And here's what they'll discover. Jesus loves them. He loves them. See, the good news of the gospel, dear friends, is that the king will not abandon his people. The king will not forsake his people. Uh, Whatever hardship we face, whatever difficulty we're going through, the king knows. And he reminds us that the day is coming when he will come and he will humble our enemies and he will exalt us. See, despite what the world tells you, Jesus loves you. And their lies, their lies can't deny that fundamental truth. See, if you were a Christian here today, can can I just, I know it sounds very trite for the pastor to say it, but it's important you hear it. If you were a Christian here today, Jesus says to you, I love you. And the world will come to know that on that great day. They might not know it now. They might not recognize it now. But the day is coming when they will be clear that I love you. But it might be worth you remembering that today. See, because if you're anything like me, when life is hard, when the challenges come, when it's a bit of a struggle, when things don't go the way I think they should or I hope they would, but what's my conclusion? Nobody loves me. Everybody hates me. I'm going in the garden to eat worms. Or is it just me that does that? See, we feel the weight of that, don't we? Which is why we need to wrestle with passages of Scripture like this that remind us, that remind us the King of Kings loves Luke Giles. The King of Kings loves you. And one day, one day all my enemies will be humbled. And one day I will be exalted for them to see that. For them to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus loves me. I we're told in this passage uh, that, that, that the day is coming and on that day they will see Jesus' love demonstrated because he will keep them from harm. Did you pick that up, verse 10? He says, I will keep you from the hour of trial. See, the day is coming when there will be an hour of judgment. It will be a terrible and frightening judgment. But here's the good news. The good news is not just because we love him, but because we trust him and recognize him as our king. Jesus says, I will protect you from that day. I will keep you from the harm of that trial. Now in that judgment hour, you and I do not have to fear. We do not have to fear. We will not face what the world faces in that hour. You see, that's why it will be clear to them as they face their judgment as they incur the wrath of the king, they will discover not just that we've been loved by this Jesus, but we've been accepted by him. We've been welcomed into his presence, and he's wrapped his loving arms around us and said, now, now you are with me. You see, at that moment, beyond a shadow of a doubt, we will know we've not missed out a thing. Not a thing. At that moment... We will know it's all been worth it. Every struggle, every hardship, every difficulty, every turning of the other cheek, every going the extra mile, every sacrifice. See, at that moment, we will know it's all worth it. Our problem, dear friends, is we don't look into the future enough. We we, we evaluate things based on present experience. Present experience is dangerous. We've got to have a future hope. A future hope. A hope of that day when the king humbles our enemies and exalts his people. Because when that is my hope, when that is the picture, the perspective I've got, and then I'll do what they were doing in verse 10. See, I will keep the command to endure patiently. Then I will be committed to patient endurance. Then I will, verse 11, I will hold on. I'll hold on because I know he's coming. And he's coming soon for that day. And so today I'll hold on. I'll hold on to the promise of vindication. I'll hold on to the hope of glory. I'll hope on to that day when I will be exalted and my enemies defeated. I think it's probably worth saying to you that in the context of this section, patient endurance 
or enduring patiently has to do with faithful witness. Has to do with faithful witness to remaining true to his name. See, in verse 8, Jesus placed before them an open door that no one can shut. I think he's reminding them. He's reminding them that no matter what they are going through, no matter what circumstances they face, the door always stands open for them to witness to him. The door is always open for them to give testimony to the gospel and the power of the gospel that saves even the frail, even the weak, even the humble. The door stands open for them to live as Christ's faithful people today. And no outside force can stop that. You have to know that today. No matter how bad it gets, no outside force can shut the door on you. No outside force can stop you from living faithfully for Jesus. Only you do that. And so here, despite fearsome opposition, despite wavering strength, the door will always be open for them to be authentic disciples who remain true to Jesus. As one writer helpfully says, human weakness is no hindrance to the power of God. See, when you are at your weakest, God, by his power, is strong and mighty if we will just remain true to his name. And so even now, even today, is the opportunity for you and me to be faithful witnesses to Jesus. To patiently endure, despite, despite physical weakness, despite the lies of the world, despite the hardships we face. Today we can remain faithful to Jesus as we patiently endure because we know vindication is coming and because we know vindication is coming we know that the prize of victory that's the second thing i want us to know and the prize of victory will be ours see our victory is not just that we escape judgment we do that but you know they they often talk in in military terms they talk about to the victor the spoils well can i suggest you there are spoils for us Uh, did you pick them up as janine read for us jesus tells us Down in verse 12, he says, I will make you a pillar in the temple of my God. I will make you a pillar. Now, I don't know about you, that doesn't sound particularly attractive. It's not the thing that floats my boat. I was trying to imagine, uh, Ross and John uh, ferried in together today. I was trying to imagine, I wonder if they had it in the car on the conversation on their way in this morning. Oh, Ross, Ross, I hope somebody calls me a pillar today at church. It's kind of not the thing you were hoping for and thinking about, is it? It seems to be the most unflattering thing until you remember this is the book of Revelation. This is painting a spiritual truth for us. The pillar, just think about that for a moment. What does a pillar do? How important is a pillar in a building? One writer helpfully says, he says a pillar symbolizes strength and stability and permanence. Pillars belong inseparably to the whole structure and they are indispensable to the building. Without the pillar, the building falls down. I had the great privilege of doing a building project in the church that I was at before. It was quite a big building project. Uh, We bashed a whole bunch of the church down. We redesigned everything uh, so we could fit more people in. It was great. I loved it. It's the kind of thing that floats my boat. I remember sitting with architects and engineers and we were debating and uh, in the plans there was this ugly horrible pillar right in the middle and I was like you've got to be kidding me you know this is a church hall we you know we don't want a pillar here and we we argued over this pillar and I kept on pleading begging asking da, 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 pushing the architect pushing the architect and I'll never forget it. we're sitting in a meeting and one of the most timid quiet structural engineers who'd be, who was part of the project he eventually looked at me he said Luke we can put the pillar wherever you want us to why didn't you tell me that ages ago? He said to me, on one condition. He said, you don't complain when the roof falls in. <laughs> See, that particular pillar, because we weren't doing a new build, we were merging two buildings, it was so strategic, it carried the weight of the roof on that pillar. So if you go into Takai Community Church today, and if you look three meters in front of the cry room, you will see the most ugliest pillar you've ever seen in a local church. But you take that pillar out, the church building falls down. The roof will collapse. 
See, the pillar is about strength. The pillar is about stability. The pillar is about permanence. And Jesus says to believers, he says to you, you, you are like that pillar when it comes to the eternal house of God. You have a place of stability and strength and permanence. You have an abiding place filled with richness and dignity and value and worth in the sanctuary of God. See, I understand that being called a pillar is not the most flattering thing in the world. But can I tell you one of the most assuring things in the world is to know that we will stand in the presence of God for all eternity and nothing, nothing can shake that. Nothing can remove that truth. You and I will be a pillar in the house of God and we will never be excluded. And did you notice, he doesn't just say, you'll be a pillar. He, he, says, he says, actually, I will put my name. Look, I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem. He's going to label you. Why on earth would he do that? I mean, simplistically, just ask, what are the things you label? What do you put labels on? They're things that belong to you, aren't they? I, I, I learned this trick from Bishop Dez. I, I buy a brand new theological book. The first thing I do is I put my name in it. Because Christian ministers, they steal your books. They do. They come and they borrow them and, and they steal them. They never come back to you. First thing I do, I put my name in the book. Why? It's mine. It belongs to me. I own this book. I've even now started putting the province in just in case they forget which Luke Giles it is they took it from. You see, you put your name on it. You put your address on it. Why? Because it's precious to you. It's valuable to you. You don't want to lose this. You, you, you want this to, to be clear that it belongs to you. And just think about this. God says, I'm going to put my name on you. You bear the name of God. That's what it means to be a Christian. He says to us, look, I'm going to put my name and address on you. You are my treasured possession. You will be labeled in such a way so that you will never be lost because you are precious to God. We had the great joy a few years ago of going to Disney land with the boys when they were little. And we were helpfully advised by the hotel to take a big black cokey and write their name and our telephone number on their arm, literally on their arm, to do it. So that if they got lost, uh, somebody would know how to get hold of us. We were in a group, there were a couple of families doing this. Uh, and, and actually, as it turned out, we did lose one of them. I, I said to Nikki, we should take a, make a break for it. But apparently the mother of the child wanted to keep them. Uh, and it was great, because we lost this child. But within 20 minutes, they were found. I don't know if you've ever been to Disney, it's huge. Within 20 minutes, they were found and returned to us. Why? Because they had the name on. They had the number on. See, so you and I, dear friends, we, God says to us, you, you are precious to me. You are valuable to me. I'm going to put my name on. And I want you, uh, just allow me a little bit of poetic license for a moment. Did you notice, he, he takes it even further. He doesn't just say, I'm going to put one of those, those, those name labels on that's impersonal. Did you notice that he, if you keep reading, he says, he says, I'm going to put you the name that just I know. I will also write on them my new name for them. My new name for them. Friends, this isn't just about ownership. This is about intimacy. This is personal. J Jesus has got a personal name for you and for me. A term of affection. A term of endearment. I don't know how maybe your wife's sitting next to you and this is probably not a fair question to ask you, but I wonder if you've got a pet name for your wife and I wonder if you remember it. Schnookums, sweet pies, lovey doves. Maybe you're sitting next to your husband, hunk, good looking. I don't know, I don't know what you call him. But here, here's what we, in our house, it's just, hey, you. We've we, we got so many jades in our house, it's, I get confused who they are. You know, it's scary. But Jesus says, I've got a name for you. I, I'm wanting you to feel the weight of what Jesus tells us is our prize. Our prize is we belong to the King of Kings, and we will dwell with the King of Kings for all eternity. That is the door that he has opened, and no one can shut it. At the end of a, the most glorious chapter of Romans chapter 8, there is this whole long list where Paul looks at creation and angels and death and life, and his conclusion is this. Nothing in all creation is able to separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, that's my prize, dear friends. 
And when I'm going through the lousy day today, when I'm going through the horrible circumstance today, do you know what I've got to remember? I've got to remember this isn't the final chapter. No, the best is still to come. My prize awaits. And when I realize the prize awaits, then here's the thing, then I can be content today. I can be satisfied today. You see, I think when we understand that we belong to Jesus and he belongs to us, that that our home is not this world but that world, well, then I can discover contentment in this world. See, those who endure, those who are accepted, those who are included, they belong to Jesus and nothing will change that. Can I ask you, what more do you want? What more do you want? If you've got the hope of heaven, if you've got the glory of eternity, If you've got the security of God's love, what more do we actually want? We have acceptance. We have security. We have affection. See, I fear in my own life, in my own life, that sometimes my FOMO reveals that I'm not actually satisfied with Christ. I'm not actually satisfied with Christ. I fooled myself into thinking I need more. I need something else. And so I need to hear the truth of the scriptures. You see, I I should not be afraid of missing out when I realize what I've already got. When I realize how rich and how wealthy I am in Christ. And so when we see the prize, we'll learn to be content with Jesus. We'll learn to persevere with him. And therefore we will miss out in this world. We will sacrifice in this world. We will make different choices in this world. Why? Because we've got Jesus. And we've got a glorious future that awaits. And so we will be satisfied. We will be content. Because we've already got it. And so if you'll allow a little bit of poetic license, we will replace FOMO with JOMO. We'll replace the fear of missing out with the joy of missing out. We will miss out on this world. We will miss out materially. We will miss out immorality wise. We will miss out to serve. We will miss out because we have Jesus. We have the promise of vindication. We have the prize of victory. We have Jesus. And Jesus is enough. But maybe you don't have Jesus. Maybe you don't have Jesus. Maybe you don't have the promise or the prize. Maybe you don't have the king of kings. And so maybe you can't afford to miss out now because this world is as good as it's going to get. Maybe you've got everything now, but sadly you'll be missing out for eternity. And maybe if that's you, you need to speak to someone today. You need to either speak to the person who brought you or you need to come and chat to me. I'll hover around the front. Because here's the thing, until you've got Jesus, you'll never have enough. You'll never have enough. But once you've got him, then you'll have everything.